different now that we're in a bigger room. Actually, might be better. I can't see you. So, ah, uh, glad to hear Rob six years as pastor. And let me tell you, long ago, I didn't have much hair then. Uh, I did serve as pastor of a church, so I understand a little bit. It wasn't for six years. Uh, I have the privilege of this morning of kind of being in the role of a prophet where I speak or teach as called upon. And just let me tell you how much I admire Rob in his role of pastor and the gift of God that I have seen at work and present in your life, I am grateful for to see here in this congregation, in this fellowship, and always be thankful that God has put such a man as a lamppost and a light in, in McDonough and Stockbridge. Thank you, Rob, for your service. I really mean that. All right. If you don't have a Bible, you might want to get one. Uh, I believe we've got some. I see Wade back there. You can just lift your hand, signify that you need a Bible. We're going to various places. You all know that the way Calvary Chapel does is to uh, teach book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Well, no way would I make a complete chapter today. In fact, there's no way I would make... Uh, Certainly not a book, not a chapter, so I'm looking at a verse, and we're going line upon line, precept upon precept, and looking at one verse today, and I thought about it and called it sort of a topical message. I hope what it will be doing is getting into this one verse in depth. And giving you something that you can hold on, there are these verses in the Bible that we will the Lord will just open up to us, and there are times to slow down and look at, uh, I remember Jesus saying that heaven and earth might pass away, but so long as there remain not a jot or tittle of His Word would pass away. So that means to me that there are times when we need to set the plow deep and get in depth, and that's what we're going to do this morning when Rob mentioned to me the Lord led me to this verse, and over the past a uh, couple of weeks, few weeks, so that's one of the differences. I've had two to three weeks to prepare for this. Rob is doing something fresh every Sunday. Uh, let me tell you all, from that perspective, it's tough. And as we settled on this and kind of made notice, so when Rob gets to Romans 14, he can kind of book in the rest of the chapter around this verse. Uh, you need to have that context. So that's one warning, one thing to be aware of. I am pulling one verse out of a chapter. The other thing for you note takers out there, my PowerPoint slides today are to keep you where I'm going. If you try to write down everything on these slides, you won't hear what I'm saying. We'll find a way to get the full PowerPoint presentation to you if you want to. That way you can focus and concentrate with me. Before we get into it, how to be happy. I hope all of this is going to tie together. Those of you that know me just a little bit know that I am not a prosperity preacher. So you're going, why in the world have you titled a sermon, How to Be Happy? Well, it's a lifelong journey. And through some of the things that the Lord has done in my life and in the role that I serve in, He has shown me some various things. And that's going to be my prayer as we take it one more time to the Lord in prayer and give Him His time before we jump into this roadmap for the journey of Romans chapter 14, verse 17, how to be happy. Father, I come to you today. And uh, over the past few weeks, as you have been speaking to me out of this verse and about some things in life, Father, there have been times... My study hasn't been in the typical places. It's been all over the place, and you've been there. And Father, you have powerfully touched me. Father, and whether it's been in the lowest depths of a valley, or whether it's been on the highest heights of a mountaintop, 
You have been there and you have brought it together in this verse for me personally. Now, Father, in the time that I have this morning to speak to your people, I pray that you'll take this cracked pot, you'll take this stained glass, and that you will pour yourself through me so that it's not Daniel's message, but Father, it is the message of Jesus Christ and the power of your Holy Spirit to touch your people who need to hear your word so that they will have your vision and that they will be encouraged each and every moment, each and every day, every month, and every year of their lives here. Father, that you do take us by the hand and lead us into your promised land. And you encourage us through your word today, this one verse and all of those that we're going to use to support it, to know that we can have happiness in this life, though it's not the happiness of the world. It is the happiness of Jesus Christ. Father, we praise You and glorify You as we get into Your Word now. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Every word important. So what we're going to look at, I do a lot of bike riding, I do a lot of long distance riding, and one of the first things that I learned in long distance riding is that it is very important to know the route. In randonneuring, the type of riding that I do, we call the route king. You have got to follow the route. In fact, the rules are so strict that if you are riding the route and you get lost, you have to return to the exact point of the route where you lost your way and take over again or you'll be disqualified from the ride. Sometimes we've got some flexibility in that. There's some grace there. Uh, depends on the level of ride. This August, there will be a lot of people going over to Paris, and they will do the big ride that we all train for. They are very strict. If you go off route in Paris, Brest, Paris, you must return exactly to the points you left the route to pick up your ride. So Romans 1417 is going to be our roadmap and give us our waypoints or our checkpoints on how to be happy as Christians in this life. So the first waypoint, where we've got to get started, the very foundation is check your citizenship. Have you ever thought about to whom you belong? We think about being Americans, we're going to celebrate that in a couple of the weeks, July the 4th, Independence Day, and... Very few people even understand anymore what it means to be an American citizen. Well, what does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? The first thing we have to ask ourselves, what is meant by the phrase, the kingdom of God? And it is a phrase describing a place where God is worshipped as the only ruling authority and power. Could spend some time there, I'm going to keep moving. Where is the kingdom of God? Jesus provides us the clearest waypoint to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, in the following discussion with the Pharisees. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Let's look at that. The kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is found in following Jesus as king. This is why Jesus told the Pharisees that the kingdom of God was in their midst, because He was present with them. You see, some other people, and I'm trying not to get... There's been some bad teaching about that. I want to get you to the good teaching that the kingdom of God is in our midst when Jesus is in our midst. The kingdom of God is present where Jesus is present. I could take some time there. I won't. I'll just say that's why we come together as a church for where two or three are gathered. There am I also, Jesus told us. We are in the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is in us this morning because we have come together, two or three or more, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
So if you don't know, you might be asking, how do I become a citizen of God's kingdom? You were born an American citizen, or you were naturalized to be an American citizen, or you're a citizen of another country. We understand that, but how do we become a citizen of God's kingdom? You must want to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. Nobody's going to force you to be a citizen in God's kingdom. And you'll find that Jesus will make himself known to you. John chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Jesus answered, he's talking to Nicodemus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That is an essential verse to understand. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus that we must be born again. Therefore, when a person accepts Jesus as their king, he's the only sacrifice and forgiveness for sin as the master to follow in this life and as the Lord of all to worship. That person is born again in his or her spirit, in our inner being, and spiritually by faith in is the kingdom of God. I want you to notice the two places, spiritually and physically. If you don't understand that relationship now, things get kind of confusing. And that's when we ask the question, well, you're telling me all this, when can I expect to live in the kingdom of God? 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, uh, verse 50, the resurrection chapter. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Until the Lord's return, we do not physically live in the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is spiritually alive in those who choose to worship Jesus as king. As disciples of Jesus, we are now living in the kingdom of God spiritually and waiting on the physical kingdom. Understanding that, we look at our citizenship because our citizenship lets us know if you're on the right road. I've got a Garmin, a little computer that beeps and yells at me when I go off course. Other people would pedal several miles out of their way and they'd get to the next turn and it wasn't right and they would check their cue sheet and they would go, oh no, I'm in the wrong place. How do we living day by day know if we're in the right place or the wrong place? We have to examine ourselves to see if are we living as citizens of earth of this world or are we living as citizens of heaven? Philippians chapter 3 verses 18 through 20. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your mind set on Jesus as Lord and Master, or is your mind set on these earthly things? We follow the right way to living happily by choosing to be citizens of heaven and daily checking to make sure which Lord we serve. So the second waypoint that we get to is understanding and knowing Jesus, our Lord and Master. I wish we had time to do word studies on those words, but we're going to keep moving. How do I, do I live in the kingdom of God spiritually? The old hymn, Trust and Obey. I'm going to tie a lot of that old hymn in today. It holds the key on how to be a happy Christian, and in fact, it's where I pulled the title from. That's part of the song, How to Be Happy. How to be a happy Christian and live spiritually. Let me tell you the story of the hymn and how it came into existence. One night at a Dwight L. Moody, or better known, D.L. Moody, evangelistic meeting in Brockton, Massachusetts, a young man stood up to testify about his confidence of salvation. He said, I am not quite sure, meaning that he wasn't really certain that God would save him from his sins. And then he continued, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to obey meaning that he planned to trust God for his salvation, 
to do what he could to obey God's will. I'm going to trust and I'm going to obey. Daniel Towner was the song leader for that meeting. He was so impressed by the young man's testimony that he wrote down those words and stuck them in his pocket. Later, he wrote a friend, John Samus. In his letter, he told about the young man's testimony and included the young man's words. I am not quite sure, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to obey. Samus quickly transformed those words into a hymn course, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Soon he had five stanzas to go with the course, and he sent them to Towner, who composed the tune that we still sing today. We've got the road map, Romans 14, 17. And now we've got this old hymn that we can go to to help us remember how to live spiritually in the kingdom of God. We learn from the song that even when we are uncertain about the circumstances surrounding us, that we must put Jesus first in our lives by learning two things, learning to trust the truth of His Word and humbly being obedient to His commands. Putting Jesus first means that we must learn to trust and obey. Jesus is our only Lord and Master. Three quick points. We learn to trust Jesus by continuing in His Word. We humble ourselves by serving Jesus as our only Master, and we grow in obedience as we grow in faith in Jesus. John chapter 8, verses 31 32. You're familiar. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Do you notice Jesus says you must continue in my word? We do not start and then stop. We continue in the word of God. And we must continuously expose ourselves to reading and hearing the word of God because. Reading the Bible and hearing the Bible taught enables us to learn the truth as Jesus reveals to us the truth. And Jesus is the truth. He alone is complete reality and honesty. We could take a long time. In fact, if you ever hang out with me and we'll study the book of John, we'll talk more about how Jesus is complete reality and honesty. Jesus' teaching is the portion of truth God has chosen to reveal to us as necessary for living spiritually in the kingdom of God and physically in this fallen world. All of the Bible, even the Old Testament, is the Word of God, and Jesus is the Word of God in human flesh. Do you hear John chapter 1 running around all right there? Good. Now, some people have accused people like me of circular reasoning. You might not care about logic, and I want to let you know why this is beyond argumentative logic. Yes, this is circular reasoning because a circle is the representation of eternity without beginning or end. And Jesus is the only human representation of the eternal who has ever taught humanity the truth of the eternal God. That's why when we argue that Jesus is the Word and the Word is God and Jesus is God, they say you can't prove one without the other. And you're right because Jesus is the proof. Now, we humble ourselves by serving Jesus as our only master. We're to Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. Jesus teaching us here, no servant can serve two masters at the same time. Can I guarantee if you'll check your life like I do mine, when I find myself at the most unhappy in life, I've usually gotten my eyes off of the Lord and gotten my all, my, on some earthly things that I think that I've got to have or need. And when I come back around and go, hold on, this is all just passing away. It's all temporary and I'm stressing over things that are going to rot and rust and corrupt. Let me get my focus back on Jesus. Jesus, do I need this? And you know what? If I do need it, he has not yet failed to bring in my life what I truly need. I didn't say he's given me everything I want. But he's never failed to provide what I need. We're the servants of Jesus and must serve Jesus only. Not even our own needs. Not our appetite. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking. And our exposure to the evil in this fallen world and the sin into which we're born has produced and our physical beings, the desire to rebel against serving God alone as king of our lives. Recognize that is still in you. And we long for the day when physically we'll be in the kingdom of God. 
and then this corruptible will no longer be corruptible. This perishable will no longer be perishable. We therefore seek to find our own physical joy and pleasure based on what we feel in our bodies rather than be obedient to the commands of God found in the Bible. Serving the wrong master. This is why the New Testament repeatedly seeks to teach that we are to live by faith in Jesus and not to trust the feelings of our physical bodies. Understand that living in the kingdom spiritually means our physical needs take second place to Jesus. From the time we are born again and enter the kingdom of God, then Jesus as our master works to develop our spiritual character first because the spiritual is eternal and the physical is passing away. Last in this step, we grow in obedience as we grow in faith. So how do we have faith? You'll hear me say it over and over and over again. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. I don't know why God chose it this way, but earlier in that chapter, in, verse, in chapter 10, He says the foolishness of preaching that He has chosen. I didn't choose it. Rob didn't choose it. There's no other preacher that chose this path. God chose the preaching, the teaching, out loud, audibly of His Word to encourage and grow faith in His children, the citizens of His kingdom. So we learn that faith is first trusting in what God has revealed to us in His Word. And we've got to trust that Jesus is the truth of God and His teachings are true. Faith is then obeying the teachings of Jesus because they trust they are true. What I'm telling you this, we can get all theological on you and all of the terms to describe what is faith. I want you to go back to the hymn, what is faith? Trust and obey. Break it down very simply. When you feel your faith is challenged and you're going, oh, I don't know what, trust and obey. Make it really simple. So the way to live in the kingdom of God is to trust and obey. And this connects us to the rest of the verse in Romans 14, 17 by opening the door to righteousness, peace, and joy. So our third way point. These get shorter. It's like a long ride. As the ride gets longer, the distance between the waypoints gets shorter. Uh, getting life in order. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. That's the second part of Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Now, while we can experience righteousness, peace, and joy all at the same time, there are times in life when we do not feel like citizens of heaven. I almost like to take the time and get you to testify. Have you ever known that you belong to Jesus, but you didn't feel like you were on your way to heaven? I hope I'm not the only one that's been there. Really, I do hope I'm the only one that's ever been there. I would like for you to never have that experience. I really would. But I know that experience comes in life because our faith grows in those times. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's how we're happy. It's when our faith grows. During those times, and I want you to think whatever time, you might be in that time right now, you might have just gone through a time when you didn't feel like you were a citizen in the kingdom of heaven, or you might have one coming. What do I do when I don't feel my faith? We've got to find these blessings in the order that Paul lists in this verse. And that was the epiphany for me when I looked at Romans 14, 17. God said, Daniel, do you feel joy? And I said, well, at this moment, God, I don't feel joy. Well, Daniel, do you have peace? God, if, Dad, if I'm being honest with you, at this moment in my life, I don't have peace. So, well, Daniel, will you trust me? I got to. You're God. You're dead. You're my Lord and you're my master. He said, well, just hold on. Even if you can't see or feel peace, if you don't feel joy, hold on to the righteousness of trusting in me. And that's where first comes righteousness, while we do His good will. Then comes peace, where there is not a doubt nor a fear. And finally then comes joy, when in fellowship sweet. To get life in order while we're living in the kingdom of God, we've got to understand that that we can't always feel, that we can't always see, 
And at the end of verse 17, Paul provides us the key to experience these blessings. We'll get there, and he's going to tell us how we can ensure we're living as citizens of heaven. But we're going to see the key to this happiness is that learning to trust and obey. So we're going to go to the fourth waypoint. The first part, Jesus, our righteousness. Now I really want you to understand that because when you're down at the lowest point of life, and, and many people today, this is why this is not a prosperity message or one of these just feel-good messages, because I'm telling you, this message came to me at a time and place in my life that a lot of people as Christians want to deny. In fact, it was from the uh, Calvary Chapel uh, Church Planning Network. They posted a book at about the same time called Spurgeon's Sorrows. And I went, God, you're trying to tell me something. I actually went out to Amazon, bought the book, read most of the book, and I went, I had no idea. And what Rob don't know, when, he, when you contacted me that day for about the two weeks before that, I had been in such a dark, deep, funk, depression, that I really didn't care to draw the next breath. Immediately afterwards, here come this text about Spurgeon sorrows, and I had no idea a man that was called the Prince of Preachers battled depression throughout his life. And as God began to communicate and tell me some things about this experience, and He led me to places in the Bible, He led me to Elijah the prophet. He led me to Moses, who through the depression and the aggravation, the frustration of being a pastor of a church of over two million, lost his temper and was kept out of the promised land. We know that God buried him and he went into heaven. But God began to show me all these things, then I started reading the book, and the very same things that this Calvary Chapel pastor was pulling out of the life of Spurgeon were the same things that God was showing me. And I knew then and there. You know, we try to deny that there are dark times in life. And we may be at a place just like that young man at Moody's Bible meeting where we may not really feel sure. We may not feel the trust. There may be a storm in your life. And I don't know whether it's burdens or depression or doubt, grief, fear, sorrow, tears. The list goes on and on and on. But there are dark times in the Christian life. And I have had an aunt who was faced with the same problems and who went to her pastor and her pastor told her, if you will quit sinning, then you'll feel happy. Now let me tell you, that's not what I'm standing in front of you telling you today. There are times in life where you haven't done anything wrong and God is not punishing you, but you are going through a place in life for whatever reason, you've just got to hang on through the storm of life. You have got to overcome, and I want you to be prepared. If I had time, we'd go back, and I didn't pull the story out, but when Jesus and His disciples, they had crossed the Sea of Galilee, He did some amazing mir miracles, and He told His disciples, this is key to that passage. He said, guys, we're going to the other side. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Jesus told His disciples, we're going to the other side. They got in a boat, and sometime after midnight, they thought they saw... And I don't have time to teach you all this in Matthew. We could get in depth. They thought they saw a soul-sucking demon walking across the top of the water. When you understand your Jewish mythology, when they were in the boat, in the midst of the storm, they thought what they saw, first of all, was a soul-sucking demon of Jewish legend that was coming to kill them in that boat in the midst of the storm. The next thing you know, it's Jesus walking on the water to get to them. Can I tell you, sometimes what we feel or think isn't what's real. What's real is Jesus is walking toward us in the midst of that storm to help us out. And I look at Peter, and we all kind of get on Peter. Peter was the one that kind of, you know, manned up enough to say, hey, let me hop out this boat and come to you. You remember the story. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on water. When he took his eyes off of Jesus, he sank. How do we overcome the storms in life? We remember that to walk above the drowning waves, we must look to Jesus, and looking to Jesus means first we trust and obey. I'm telling you, I'm breaking it down simple, coming back over and over. 
When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but His smile quickly drives it away. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll He doth richly repay. We may not feel happy, and we may not feel joy, but still we must trust Jesus that He holds our hands in this life. And can I tell you, when I'm down so low that I don't think I can stand, if I will reach up, I can take hold of the Master's hand. We may not see the way out, but we must by faith trust and obey His command and wait until Jesus, He alone takes us by the hand and leads us into His promised land. And if you're in a place that is so dark and deep, you don't see the way out, I'm not telling you to quit sinning. I'm telling you to hold on. Look for His smile. The Master is on His way. Quit looking at the waves. And hold on, brother. Hold on, sister, because Jesus is coming for you and He will take you by the hand and get you out of that place you're in. So despite the doubt, the grief or darkness in our lives, we choose to trust what? Jesus is our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. But by His doing... Oh, if you've got your Bible somewhere, you're already there. Mark that, highlight that, tag that. By His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Do you hear the Word of God? So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We belong to God by His doing. And by His grace, we are in Christ Jesus. And since it is by God's will, then we will not mess up things so bad that He will ever leave or forsake us. I want you to understand and hear that. Now, you might be embarrassed and you might be ashamed and you're going to feel guilt even when you trip and stumble and fall, but we're in this by His grace and it is His grace that is going to get us through. I understand what Pastor Chuck taught because I came from a holiness church and I understand the legalism that says when you mess up, you fouled up and you need to writhe in pain and, and in this squalor until you can get clean enough to come back to God. No, I don't have to get clean enough. All I have to do is look back to Him because He is righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We were taught by a very legalistic way. They, I was actually told once, it's hilarious today, I am teaching you in blue jeans. And I was told one time at a youth meeting that I needed to leave the youth meeting because as a preacher, I shouldn't wear blue jeans. That was sanctification. We've had preachers and teachers go up and run a revival wearing a wedding ring and they shut the revival down because they were wearing a wedding ring. That was what we taught was sanctification. And you know, maybe you're not taught the legalism that way. Maybe it's some other way that you're taught that you're experiencing the pain you're experiencing because you haven't pleased God. Can I tell you, you can't please God that way. Jesus pleased God that way. That's why He is our righteousness. And it's not sanctification because I can be strong enough and I can be big enough and I can be bold enough and I can have a strong enough will to do everything right. Jesus did everything right. That's why He's sanctification. That's why He was the sinless, spotless, perfect Lamb that is our redemption and our atonement. And we have absolutely always got to understand Jesus is our righteousness. We cannot work ourselves into or out of the kingdom of God, but we are to work out our salvation by simply learning to trust and obey. Then our faith lived out by choosing to trust and obey will allow us to experience the next level of living in the kingdom of God, and that is knowing that Jesus is our peace. We've passed the midway point, and let me tell you, on a 380-mile bike ride, when you get past the halfway point, you start feeling a little bit better. You might still have some tough places to go, but you start feeling a little bit better because you know that it's a shorter distance to get home than what you've already gone. The next level of living in the kingdom of God is learning how to experience God's peace in our lives. Wow, I need a good dose of this. What is peace? 
To understand the concept of biblical peace, think of the Hebrew word shalom. But now I'm going to Thayer's Greek dictionary because I like the way he defines Christian peace as being the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is. You need to remind me to print that out somewhere and hang it up when I forget it. Go back and read this definition of peace. Have you ever thought of peace the way this Bible scholar defined it? The tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is. We're going to get to a verse to prove that. Peace is the desired blessing of all of God's people. It's the way when you go back, if you will read carefully the New Testament, I don't care if it was Peter, if it was John, if it was Paul, if it was James, over and over in their closing blessings, they prayed that you might experience the peace and joy of the Lord, or the grace and the peace of the Lord. Can I tell you, if you ever got somebody the Lord lays them on your mind and you're not sure what to pray for them, pray that they will be blessed with the peace of the Lord and you can't do a better prayer than that because let me tell you, to have that peace. And what kind of peace are we talking about? We know that Jesus is our peace from John chapter 14. Jesus teaches His disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Jesus told His disciples that He was giving them His peace. We are also His disciples as we trust and obey. We are assured that Jesus has given to us His peace as well. John 16, verse 33 these things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Now I wish he had left that part out. He didn't. In the world you have tribulation. So long as we're in this world, tough times are coming. But take courage, be of good heart, cheer up. I have overcome the world. The peace we find in the kingdom of God is not a peace of our own making, but the peace of Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. It is the calm in the midst of the storm and not always escape from the storms of life. It is knowing that when you find yourself in the storm, it is knowing when you're reaching for the pistol, it is knowing when you have seen the tree and calculated the speed it's going to take so that you don't walk away from the car, that the Prince of Peace says no. Turn to me. I'm your peace. I'm your tranquility. I'm your calmness. And we go back and we trust. He's our righteousness. I've got the assurance. I've got to obey. He says, look here. You're in my hand. You're in my plan. And don't you ever dare, as my servant, think that you can choose what time or place you can punch your bus ticket home. He says, that's for me to do, not for you to do. Let me tell you, when His peace comes in, in the midst of the storm, you may not understand the storm or where you're at, but thank God for that peace that comes in. It is that calm in the midst of the storm, not always escape. 16, 33, last little phrase. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. Since Jesus has already overcome the world, then through the gift of His peace... We are more than overcomers. We are conquerors through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Paul Walker from Mount Perrin for preaching that over and over and over. To This poor redneck understood it one day. We are more than conquerors. We are overcomers through Jesus Christ. Fifth way point. It is God's gift of grace that enables us to overcome this life, find the contentment, whether we are abased or abounding in the material needs of life. Remember that one definition? Hey, I can flip back here. Where it said, uh, so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot. Paul says in Philippians 4, 11 through 13, not that I speak from want, for I have learned 
to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. Couldn't you left out the back part? Both, wait, what is that? The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Wow, this is all coming together. Both of having abundance and suffering need, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. We will learn that we do not experience the Lord's peace when we allow fear and doubt to displace our faith and trust. So this is a discipline. We're disciples of a master. We as believers must learn in this life. It's why we're on a journey. As we learn to live in righteousness and peace by our trust and obedience in Jesus, then we discover the highest of blessings. Oh. As we reach the higher levels of living in the kingdom of God, we get to this sixth waypoint, the joy of the Lord. We discover the promise and the experience and the joy of the Lord as citizens of His kingdom. And I wanted to define, so I went to Webster's Dictionary. I think it's the 1858 version. The passion or emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good. That excitement of pleasurable feelings which is caused by success or good fortune, that's the way we typically define joy. The gratification of desire or some good possessed or by a rational prospect of possessing what we love or desire. Gladness, exultation, exhilaration of spirits. So the blessing of living in Jesus is cheerfulness, Godliness with contentment and being delighted in Jesus, that's the joy of the Lord. If He is your delight, you will never be disappointed. Oh, need more time to go over that. Moving. Jesus demonstrates this process, and this is what I want you to catch, because at the dark place, and then it was proven out in Spur the book Spurgeon's Sorrows, we always focus on the cross of Christ. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus went through a depression so hard that physically for Him to fight the depression of taking on the world's sins, His sweat became as great drops of blood. I want you to understand, there is not a single point where we are tested or tried that our Master has not already overcome it. Let me tell you, that was powerful when I understood and realized that in the process, Jesus first living in righteousness, then peace, then joy on His journey to the cross. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. What did Peter have to do? The author and perfecter of faith, beginning and the end, and He's all in the middle. Who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. He didn't experience joy on the cross. But because of his expectation of the good that his Father God was going to do for him and us, he went through the process and the pain of the cross with the joy set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we learn from Jesus that our focus must be on what is eternal and not fading away. Yet too often we fail to understand the overwhelming joy that will be ours in eternity if we will but overcome the trials, tribulations, and struggles of this life. The hope of heaven's jubilee and that glad reunion day will motivate us to live in joy here and now as well as in the sweet by and by. If you catch the hints there, I hope you will. Yet there is joy in this life. Time's running out on me, but I've got to tell you, too many people forget to preach this part. There is joy in this life. Yes, there is joy in the life to come. But even though we live in a world full of tribulation, there is joy in Jesus Christ in this life. Because the kingdom of God is present within us, then we can learn to find joy and happiness in our journey while we're passing through this fallen world. We learn that in this life, joy comes in moments. And the moment often passes very quickly. However, we can live in the joy of the Lord by training our memories to hold on to those moments of joy, and in so doing, we are given a preview of heaven. You need to catch this. A guy will sell you a book for $8 from the Mayo Clinic to try to teach this to you. Jesus has already been teaching us this. 
This guy just discovered it through a psychological study. God slapped me upside the head and said, Look, Daniel, I've already pointed it out to you. What did Jesus tell His disciples to do in the communion? Do this in remembrance of Me. That's why He's Master and Lord in God. In remembrance, if we will remember the good times and the good things, and if we will work really hard to wipe away every tear here and now when we get to heaven, I believe that one of the greatest joys of heaven will be the memories we carry with us that will be purified by God and all sorrow, darkness, and grief removed from those precious memories. Let's practice that here and now. Cherish the opportunity of every moment in this life to create memories that will last for eternity. Now the key to living continually in the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit, such blessings are the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is our lifeline, our intercessor between God and us. We must daily, rather in every moment of this life, lived in this corrupt, alluring world, depend, call on the power of God to overcome the power of darkness that surrounds us. No cry for spiritual favor is too weak, and the Spirit of God will not fail in performing His job. Don't let your flesh or the accuser ever keep you from crying out to the Lord to be filled fresh for the moment with the Spirit of the Lord. Can I tell you, that's what the enemy does. When we're in that place and we think we've lost our way and we think we can't go on anymore, any further, he says, don't cry out to Jesus. Come on, now I'm thinking about the third day song. Y'all heard the story of the song, Cry Out to Jesus. The man drove his car down into the woods. If you've been to a third day concert, they'll tell you the story. Everything was bad. He and his wife were divorcing, losing his job. He drove his car down into the woods, had the gun in his hand. He turned on the radio station, and a third day song played that ministered to his heart, and he didn't go through with it. He cried out to Jesus, and Jesus met him where he needed him. Do you hear the point that we keep going back out to? Never let anyone or anything in this life, no matter how bad the health, no matter how poor the wealth, no matter how deep the sorrow or trouble, let you think that you can't cry out to Jesus. He will always be there. Do be aware. I got to, uh, out of time, but I got to get to this part. Do be aware that though without trust and obedience, we can grieve and resist the Holy Spirit. We grieve and resist the Holy Spirit when we do this. We're still citizens of God's kingdom, but we find ourselves practically defenseless against the onslaught of this world. How do we resist the Holy Spirit? We resist Him when we do not trust God's Word. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit when we do not obey the Lord? Be of good cheer though. For the power of God is always at hand even when we have grieved the Spirit of God because the grace of Jesus continues to wash away our sins when we confess our sins and get up out of the mud puddle. Disciple song. Uh, it ties all together because a lot of these other people have caught this. If we will confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, then get up and get on. Last one. We return to the words of the hymn to be encouraged on this lifelong journey and remember if we ever lose our way to go back to our first love and follow the road map of Romans 14, 17. For we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. That's righteousness. For the favor He shows, peace, and the joy He bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at His feet or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He sins we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. So we'll be happy in Jesus so long as we trust and obey. If you have a prayer request, if you, however you want to do it, we're going to ask for your prayer request. 
We're going to pray for you if you want to raise your hand. If you, however, I'm not going to do it. If you want to make it all to call, we'll make it all to call. God wants to do it, however. If you've got something in your life, and I've talked about some things, and you need to cry out to Jesus, don't let anything stop you from raising your hand and letting one of the elders or one of the pastors or another member. If you don't have a title in the church, but you're at the place where you've got peace and joy in this life and somebody else needs you to pray with them, pray with them. Comfort those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. As we close it out, and I'm going to start us in just a second. If you've got a prayer request, raise your hand. Let somebody know, hey, I need you to pray with me. And I'm going to open this up in prayer. Father, we come to you. And uh, I don't know how you've ministered to your congregation today. I don't know how you've ministered to your people. But I can tell you, Lord, if you haven't ministered to anyone else through the study of this message, you have ministered to your prophet. I know Elijah, at the height of his ministry, when the false prophets of Baal were cast down and things still didn't go his way, he ran. But Jesus, you met him. Spurgeon, through a horrible situation that happened, he faced the grief and the sorrow and the depression. And yet, we remember Spurgeon today as the Prince of Preachers. Jesus, as you went into the Garden of Gethsemane, your disciples didn't understand, and there's a place in Proverbs that says the, only the heart knows its own sorrow. They, they couldn't grasp the cup that you were about to drink. You, who were sinless and perfect and clean, You're going to take on the sins of the whole world. Even, you're just amazing, Jesus. And you fought through it. And you wanted them to pray and watch with you. So Father, if there's anyone here that has that need, any need, whether it's health, whether they're at a place that they don't feel your joy, nor your peace, nor even feel righteous, don't let them hesitate. God, if they don't raise their hand here and now, Father, if they're watching from somewhere else, oh, do not let the enemy keep them from reaching out. Father, we pray now. We've got just a few moments as we sing the closing song. I pray that You continue to minister. That You continue to do Your work. Father, You have said that Your Word would no, not go forth void or empty. You break the ground that needs to be broke with Your Word. And You water the soil that needs to be watered with Your Word. And You turn our eyes to You, Jesus, so that our love for You won't be choked out by the things of this world. You bless Your people. Oh God. You smile on Your people. You turn Your face and watch over Your people. And in that Levitical blessing, the height of it was, let Your people experience the peace. So let us know, Father, and experience your joy, your peace, and your righteousness. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord.